Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 Debrief. Um, we're going to be going over two weeks worth of uh, city council meetings, but, um, but I don't think this will be a particularly long episode. Um, we're going to be going over uh, committee chairs, um, who is chairing what committee. Um, and then we're going to be going over a little bit of uh, marijuana licensing again. And then we're going to be touching on a couple of meetings that um, that happened that weren't exactly city council meetings, uh, but one was uh, on a Fernald and one was on Department of Transportation. Um, and this week I am joined by our colleagues, Sister James Kellys. Hello, everyone. And Josh Castor. Hello, everyone. Um, so we're going to jump in talking about committee chairs, um, which is a super niche thing that uh, very few people enjoy, but I think it's incredibly interesting. Um, and so uh, James is actually at most of these meetings, so I'm going to let James uh, introduce this and also list off the committee chairs themselves, and then we'll do a little bit of back and forth. Okay, so uh, committee assignments ended up happening on the meeting of the 17th with some additional committees uh, designated on the 23rd. We're going to run down the whole list of people who attend, who ended up chair and then talk about what we think that indicates. So for uh, the long-term debt, it was uh, Pat Patrick O'Brien, a uh, large counselor, chairing that again. Uh, economic and community development used to be Kathy Ann Harris, and it's now going to be Anthony LaFauci. Uh, license and franchises uh, is Carlos Vidal again, though it was almost Paul Cates. Uh, ordinance and rules uh, used to be Darcy and is now uh, Kathy Ann Harris. Uh, finance is still chaired by Joey LaCava. Veterans is still chaired by Sean Durkee. The Ritzy Committee is uh, chaired by Kathy and Harris again, and the newly created WCAC Committee is uh, chaired by Dunn. So there wasn't actually a lot of turnover there. Um, Anthony Fauci uh, chairing Economic and Community Development, definitely new. Um, some, of, some, of the, um, some of the losers of the day, uh, I think we're definitely George, Colleen, and um, and Paz. Uh, George, um, to a lesser extent, but he used to chair ordinance and rules 15 days ago, and now he doesn't even sit on the committee, probably the most powerful committee of all the council. Um, and so definitely a shaft there, uh, which is interesting because um, for people that pay very close attention to stuff, um, Kathleen McMiniman and George Darcy, I used to think were thick as thieves. I thought they were like best friends. Um, and now it really seems like there's a lot of uh, tension between the two. Um, the two biggest losers I think are Colleen Bradley MacArthur and Jonathan Paz, who both sit on like one and a half committees. Uh, they both sit on veterans, but veterans rarely meets um, at all. Um, and they both sit on uh, one other committee. Um, now, I did bring this up uh, a couple of weeks ago, the fact that any counselor can go to any committee and, and be, have their opinion be heard. It's not, it's not that difficult. It's easier to get your opinion heard uh, if you sit on the, the, the committee because you are on the committee and you don't need a vote to be heard from. But anyone can say their piece at a committee as long as they get a friendly vote uh, to hear from all committee members, which 99.9% .9 happens. Um, it's more about... Um, sending a, 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 if you were to ask me if I was to be conspiratorial, it's more about sending a message. It's the vibe of the city council president and how they feel about the um, the council as a whole. And so the vibe here is that the people that have been really uh, not on the same page as the city council president in the past session, they all get shafted, every single one of them. And the people that, that um, that didn't make a lot of noise. Uh, they they were rewarded uh, with was, committee chairs and lots of uh, lots of screen time. Jonathan Paz was very active in the uh, economic and community development uh, committee previously, and now no longer on that. So, yeah, not on at all. Yeah, yeah, the economic and community development is a uh, is a lot of hardline uh, conservative folk now. So I'm curious how that committee is going to go. Used to be my favorite one. The uh... The thing that I'd mentioned earlier about the license and franchise committee uh, chair, 
Uh, yeah, so let's let's that, roll let's roll that yeah. clip. Uh, but you can introduce it, James, and then we'll roll and then we'll roll a clip. Yeah. So so essentially, what's going to happen is that uh, Colleen Bradley MacArthur and George Darcy attempt to vote for uh, Paul Cates to be the chair of the committee instead of uh, Vidal. And if if Cates had voted for himself, he would have been. So let's see. I nominate Carlos Vidal. Councilor McLaughlin? I nominate Paul Katz. I second the nomination of Councilor Vidal. Point of order. We don't have a second in our council rules. Um, Colleen Bradley MacArthur. Councilor Katz. Councilor Darcy. Councilor Katz. Councilor Katz. Councilor Vidal. Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor Vidal. Councillor Vidal. Councillor Carlos Vidal. Thank you. What's hilarious about the clip is that is that Paul like try to st tries to stammer. He says that he wants to he wants to second the motion for Carlos. That is not how the Walton City Council works at all. He's Paul's been in many of these meetings. He knows that seconds aren't a thing in Walton City Council. Uh, but it's just hilarious that. If he had voted for himself, he would have been the chair. Like Carlos, like thanks the committee for their confidence, but there, there there's overwhelming confidence that Paul should have been the chair of that as well, uh, which is hilarious. Um, uh, George uh, talking about going against the grain of uh, the other council. He he also um, nominated. Uh, Jonathan Paz for the long-term debt committee as well. Uh, let's show that really quickly here. Councilor Vidal nominates Councilor Brian. Do I hear any other nominations? I'd like to nominate Councilor Paz for chairman. Councilor Brian. That, that was not as exciting uh, and it did not go very far, but, um, and yeah, I think for committee chairs, the only other thing is probably um, Kathy Ann being chair of rules and ordinances, probably the most powerful committee in the Waltham City Council, and now Kathy Ann Harris uh, leads it. She's a great project manager, so hopefully, you know, it comes with good things, but she definitely has a leg up if she has a opponent um, in her city council race, which I predict she won't, by the way. Moving on to this week's city council meeting, uh, there were two public hearings, um, and I'm going to talk about one of them right now. Um, there was another retail marijuana license uh, that um, saw a public hearing. This one is called Calverde Naturals. Um, if for anyone that uh, watches the city council frequently, uh, this is actually their second time or not their first, I guess, is, I guess is more historically accurate. The first time at the city council, um, they've gotten a bunch of input uh, from residents. Um, I'm actually gonna share my screen uh, and show you where they're going. Um, so uh, so this, this retail marijuana establishment is right in front of uh, the Market Basket Drive, uh, Marketplace Drive. Um, so literally right in front of the Market Basket, there's Steve's Pizza. Um, and this would be behind Steve's Pizza. Um, uh, interesting note, uh, 100 feet away, right at, on Cutting Lane, is uh, another uh, retail marijuana license uh, currently being talked about as well. Um, both, I believe, have not uh, obtained a license. Um, and so uh, this one, this license came through uh, again, um, this time with a new uh, look to it um, and new uh, restrictions and great. What I thought was interesting about this uh, as a small note was that there is a big parking lot in the back um, of this little plaza thing. Um, and the new plan for it uh, actually eliminates the parking lot and is now green space, where, uh, which abuts uh, a bunch of houses. And their parking lot would actually be much, much smaller, uh, which is very rare that that happens with any special permit hearings at all. Um, but the uh, the only thing that uh, I thought was particularly interesting um, 
besides the unusual level of scrutiny that uh, this business owner um, went through, which is happens for every single marijuana license. Um, Paul Cates was talking about health benefits for employees and stuff like that. And that's great, you know, just let, but let's be consistent. Let's talk, let's ask that to every, every special permit hearing. Um, the only thing that was particularly interesting for me that came up was this, this new law opinion that just came out from uh, our our own Waltham Law Department about procedurally how special permits should go. Now I'm going to play a short clip from Joe Vizard, our city clerk, explaining um, what's happening, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Hey, council, I believe the advice we got is if um, if as long as the council is still taking in evidence, the public hearing should remain open. So I mean, in this case, if if the attorney saying he's submitting new plans, that would be evidence that some member of the public could wish to comment on Correct. at the public hearing. So I think this is the type of scenario they were getting at that, that if you know new information's coming in, you get all the information in during the public hearing period, and then it goes to the council when you're ready to Goes to the committee. When ready. Go, go, goes to the committee. To deliberate yeah, on the matter. When you're ready to deliberate and craft a decision. So, so thank you um, for that clarification. I do. But with that. And so essentially, uh, just to try and make this make a little more sense, um, special permits come in, they do a public hearing. Um, all special permits have to do a public hearing. Uh, and then, and then after this public hearing, which only certain things can be said during a public hearing. It's sent to a committee, um, and then anything anything goes there, um, and then it, it's voted on or done something, or people will request to, to somebody to come in and talk about it. Uh, there's deliberation being done, but generally it goes like that, and then it's voted on, so yes or no, and then the full committee council votes on it, yes or no, and then and then it goes on and on. What Joe Bizarre is saying is that our law department recently uh, came out with an opinion that says that only the final plan. Only when there is a final plan, when bring in the special permit, when they, I guess, are feeling confident that this is their final plan, that is when the special, the, the public hearing will, will close and be sent off to a committee. Um, and now what they're saying in this context is that every department has to sign off on it and then, and then they can be deliberated upon. Um, and now Joey LaCava was confused about this as well, and I am as well. Uh, from my perspective as an onlooker, I don't look at every single plan and see if every single um, department had it signed off. And so it's difficult for me to say, like, is this a common occurrence that someone didn't sign off and then it would, and then they wanted to go to committee? Is this not a common occurrence? It's hard for me to say that. And then also, if I'm confused if like every single person signed off, but if uh, for someone on the council or some someone you know, someone in the city feels that it, this is not actually their final plan. Um, where I, I am concerned about how people are going to use this uh, new law opinion uh, and is if they're going to be consistent or if this is just another part of that higher level of scrutiny that marijuana licenses have to, uh, to deal with. Um, so I'm very curious if this, uh, this new law opinion gets brought up again uh, but again, it'll be tough because I'm not going to look at every single uh, special permit and see if every single department had signed off on it. So I'll, I'll be curious when this when this law comes up. I guess it, it, it's hard to say what would be uh, consistent with like a, it being selective enforcement of this. At, at, yeah. at, at, at what point? Selective enforcement. What, what... Um... Uh, so the, yeah, so that um, so that. Public hearing actually was not is not done. It's not even in committee. It is being recessed until they mm -hmm. uh, do the thing that the committee chair uh, that the uh, department had launched. We don't even know what it was. Um, the, the they are supposed to be having in the next February meeting, I believe. Yeah, no, they're happened? they're going to be here. Yeah, uh, not next week or the week after, but the thirteenth. Uh, yeah, the thirteenth of February. Will they'll do it? They'll literally do have to redo the entire public hearing, which is insane. All of those lawyers get paid for another day of this. Um, okay, so moving on from that, uh, so we're going to talk mm -hmm. at length about one uh, 
meeting that was uh, not particularly the city council. And then we'll talk briefly about another one. We'll start with the longer one, uh, the Arnold uh, plan um, was at the Conservation Commission. And I actually did not view this meeting. So I am going to take a step back and allow uh, James to introduce this. Wow, one second, let me share my screen. How does that look? We good? Okay. So uh, the plans that were presented for the Fernold uh, at the uh, Conservation Commission meeting were specifically only open for discussion about the things that were directly up, up affected by Conservation Commission sort of restrictions, which is uh, a segment in this red circle here in the Fernold. You can see this is like the, the whole overall property. And there was a brief discussion on the monument, which is at the uh, near the Trapello Road entrance to the property. Um, just to give a little bit of background, so this is like the um, this is where the driving range that they were going to be uh, that was in the sort of the preliminary plans that came out for the Fernald that we saw were, and I did a little bit of digging in the maps to try to get a better idea of what, what it was already there and just from the google map view there was already a, a a street that showed up on it which was for what they referred to as like a malone park and it looks like that's what they're using to sort of build up on to put in this driving range um so this is the on sheet c10 here you can see this is the disc golf park and this road here that's accessing it is that road that was under discussion so they talked a little bit about this. There's apparently an Exxon pipeline that comes through here. It's a little faint on the map here, but you can kind of see it as this straight line crossing the road here. Um, this uh, C9 sheet is showing the uh, state, or sorry, this, this is one. C5 is showing the state of the property as it currently is. So you can see there's this graded, or this, this uh, level, thing which is where the road is from that above, that above ground map and i'll get to it later but you can this this passes this already passes through the conservation restriction area and but the the that extends further out here so i'm going to scroll down to this is the plan presented by the engineer for the property and you can see that it adds a uh, a parking lot and there is a uh a number of like holes for the driving range and then a uh, water collection system towards the bottom here which is supposed to collect all the stuff that would be running off from here and it's supposed to be set up for a hundred year flood all right i found it so uh the area that is highlighted in blue represents the sort of the conservation commission's jurisdiction and you can see that the uh road that right of way that was already there goes right through that already so but the uh parking lot that is added and the wastewater thing that is added are both directly in that area here and uh this area in pink here was also i believe talked about as like the minimum standoff distance for a lot of this stuff and the uh person who was chairing the, the conservation commission meeting even mentioned that they are under a lot of scrutiny from the state and that they are concerned about having things that are too liberally placed next to water like the, the conservation land and feel that that deserves extra scrutiny as a result and i think that was kind of the tone that a lot of the people on the commission had even before the public input happened and, and just to sort of take a step back this is the this is the map of how much the pavement and all this stuff encroaches on in this stuff that is the property, but is in conservation land on the property. I'm going to scroll back up to the top. This is the other map in a second here, but this topographic map, you can see this water feature that's on C12 here. That is this small feature um, present on this map. The, by the, you can see it says Clementus Brook here. That drains into this brook, into the Clematis Brook, which then drains into Beaver Brook. So anything that is getting wa washed out into there will end up downstream inevitably. And 
this is again sort of the the area in question and this section here waltham woods and the, the area sort of south of clematis brook is the girl scout camp in that area as well and a lot of the sort of overall commentary of this aside from the uh a lot, a lot of comments directly related to the overall placement of this were related to the value that the amenities were going to bring versus the potential damage to the natural environment. And as you can see, this is surrounded by a bunch of either parks, wetlands, or green space, with the only exception being the GAN Academy to the north, really. So other things that were raised were about the... Uh, the memorialization, which was also located next to the Trapello Road entrance, which I'm going to scroll down to as well. We got a first view of what that would look like as well. When they say the Braille Walk, it looks like it's a, a literally this small uh, thing, memorial here. And the only reason this was briefly talked about was not in the context of the memorial, but because it is next to the conservation land, which is on the east side of this, which is a... Um, a uh, empties into the uh another wetland further down in belmont as well so that was a lot of words uh any, any questions on the content of the meeting so um for people who don't know conservation commission their one of their most important jobs is to enforce the wetland protections act which was passed in the 1970s and is a very important law because it, it not only protects plants and animals that lives in the wetlands, it protects our drinking water supply, it protects our agricultural water supply. And it also ensures that water has somewhere to go. So when you build something, you're not just pushing water into someone else's property. Um, so if I understood correctly, James, this plan, so generally you can't build within a hundred feet of a wetland. The chair of the commission, I was there too, and Emily was there too. The chair of the commission said that it isn't uncommon for them to make exceptions to that, but usually the exceptions go down to about 50 feet. And if I understood correctly, there's a place here where it's only like five to seven feet. They're building five to seven feet from the wetland. And the engineer pointed out that this is a special situation because this land's already developed. So they're not taking nature and changing it. They're trying to improve what's there. I didn't think the the um, head of the commission seemed swayed by that argument, but I'm not sure about that. But can you say a little bit more about what their plan was for what happens to the water that that runs off of this road and off of the Gulf, uh, the Gulf? Amendment? So, so, so they said that they, it's not particularly visible on the map here, but I don't know if you can see my cursor, but. Uh, on that road, they were talking about having a water feature that would be to to capture the runoff of the road itself there. So they are taking provisions for this and the, the runoff collection point below the parking lot here. They said they are setting it up for a hundred year flood, but it's does still strike me as sort of an unnecessary risk in, given the context of all this. The uh, and specifically when you're talking about the thing that was within five feet or overlapping, it, that was this green area up here that's overlapping with this blue area that, that is the uh, the commission boundary. And I think they're pointing that they shouldn't have anything developed within there if they can avoid it. So their jurisdiction is that area because that's where the wet, that's the area within a certain distance of the wetland. And technically there, that doesn't include the amenities. So when we were making comments, it was set up front, we're not talking about that because that's not in our jurisdiction. But um, I sort of made the case and several people made the case in their comments that you're giving up something. They're asking the commission, the um, commission, there is a trade-off, there is some impact on this land. So you have to consider what is the other side of the equation? What is the value? um that the city is getting from this and so you do have to consider those amenities and their value because that's what the road is uh leading to and um so for that reason i and a few other people made comments about the memorialization of the site and about the appropriateness of the um 
using the land in this way. Um, James made comments, Emily made comments, Emily made the engineer go back to a certain slide so she could ask her question, which I love. That's a boss move. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Emily. I'm sorry she couldn't be here tonight. Um, so I had made the case in my comments that there was never an opportunity for the public to discuss the appropriateness of this plan, that this has been siloed into where each commission is being asked to approve one little aspect of it. Um, so that apparently that wasn't quite correct. So the Kim Scott, the director, um, the recreation director said when she spoke to the commission, they asked about public comment and she said there were two public comment meetings about this, which everyone <laughs> seems surprised to hear. I was aware of one other meeting about a year ago and I talked about that on the show. That was the one where we were only supposed to be talking about recreation. We weren't allowed to talk about memorialization, but it didn't end up going that way. Um, so after this happened, someone posted on Facebook asking, does anybody know about another meeting? And a person who has been following this closely for a long time said, yes, actually, there was another public input meeting, but it was several years ago. I'm not sure what year I went online. I found, uh, I think it was 2016. I'm not sure if the article, I found an article about a meeting. I'm not sure it's the same one she meant. But her interpretation was at that meeting, a lot of people actually brought up recreational ideas for the land. And her interpretation was that the mayor was trying to fit in all those ideas. And that's why there's all these recreational amenities. So uh, this is an interesting problem because so 2016, so in the time it's taken for the mayor to get approval on this, the uh, values of the community have changed. The, there's been social change happening in that time. And one, one thing is that more people are aware of the history of the Fernald, and that's largely because of Alex Green, the historian who lives in Waltham writing about it in the Globe and in other places. Uh, but he wasn't at this meeting, nor was he at that meeting a year ago. So this is definitely not just his issue anymore. There are lots of other people talking about this. The other thing is I think people who are concerned about the environment are becoming more involved in Waltham now than they were in 2016. Um, so are, what are chances for the public to talk about this? Um, but the problem is the process has been very stretched out. This meeting I wanted to acknowledge was pretty well advertised. It was on the city social media. I think there was a press release that went out because the patch wrote about it. It's um, by far so the most like, advertised I'd seen. Yeah, so meeting. so it, you know, I've talked in the past about some meetings. It seems like you know they're they're open to the public, but they don't really want us um, to know about it. But this one seemed really well. Um, publicized. So I want to acknowledge that. But another weird thing that happened, can I share my screen, James? Oh, yeah. yeah. I want to show this. Um, here it is. So this is the uh, agenda that was posted online just before the meeting with the Zoom link. And it has a note on it that says, publish reports that this is a public meeting um, by the recreation department to solicit feedback from the public on this project are in error. So I don't know what this means. I don't know where these published reports were. I thought this was very strange. If they're talking about Channel 781, that's not what we said. We said this was a meeting of the conservation commission. There's no newspaper in Waltham except the patch and the patch published exactly the release they got from the city. I was talking about this on Facebook. I know somebody else posted about it on Reddit. And it's like, it's hard to prove a negative, but I'm pretty sure this is false. Nobody ever, there were no published reports saying this. Um, so that kind of made me nervous going into the meeting because I thought that the commission was gonna perceive that we were there because of misinformation. Kind of like with the farm meeting where the counselors thought that the people supporting the farm were there because they got wrong information. And um, so they were hearing the, the, the criticism in a different way. That didn't end up happening though. The commission seemed to understand why we were there. They didn't seem particularly annoyed that we were making the case that we should be allowed to talk about things other than wetlands. Um, so it actually went um, really well, but I just wanted to point out uh, this um, very bizarre note, and I'm very curious about who put it on there and whether I should feel personally attacked by it. 
But that's all I had. Did you have anything more on this, James? Uh, one thing I will complain about is that all the photos that I was showing of the site plans were ones that I had to screen capture from the Zoom meeting recording that was that, that was there because they're not posted anywhere that I could find. There was a link shared in the meeting, actually. Yeah. So they are online, but I don't know where else to find that link now. I should have. Yeah, exactly. I, I did not have the presence of mind to click that link and save it in the, in the heat of the moment. If we find it before we post this video, we'll put it in the, the description field, though. Yes. We should, uh, I think I might be able to actually just copy it from the Zoom calls. Uh, 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 nav like, uh, like Chrome navigation. So, oh, so one more thing I should mention about the comment was, so I, my comments were kind of about the process and how there hadn't been an opportunity to discuss the appropriateness. Other people made much stronger comments about just against the plan more generally, um, including our friend Dan Sari, who said this is a rotten plan. You, you may remember him, he's been on the show before, and he actually set up a link for people to sign up who want to get involved in trying to fight this plan, and we can post that in the description of this video. Um, but he pointed out it doesn't make sense to be um, building golf amenities when we're already in an urgent situation because of climate change. That's not the right thing to be building. And he pointed out that there are people, still people alive who lived at the Fernald or their fam people who had family members at the Fernald and this is not what they want. And I don't speak for them, he doesn't speak for them, but nobody is speaking for them in this process. So I was glad he made that point. And then the rest of the speakers made a combination. Some people talked about the process, some people talked more about the environmental aspect. Some people just thought this was a bad idea overall. Um, and the committee, the commission ended up continuing it. So their next, they will have another meeting about this, which I believe will also allow public comments because they continued the, the hearing part of it. Um, and they're going to have a site visit on the 31st, which is very rare for people to even be allowed to walk onto the Fernald site. So if you can make it uh, early in the morning on the 31st. 30th. Um, it is on the 30th. 30th. Thank you. That's next Tuesday, I believe. Monday. Next Monday, Monday. at 8 a.m. Monday, Monday at 8 a.m. Monday at 8 a.m. So not a very convenient time. But if you care about this and you can possibly make it, it might be a good idea because it's rare that you get to go on the Fernald site for any reason. You can meet the commission and the applicants at 200 Trapello Road at 8 a.m. Um, one of the other things that I raised too that I just think is, I mean, it might just be showing my ignorance about like golf amenities, but it, it struck me as particularly egregious that this is like a chipping range when if you drive down Trapello and then drive up like Mill Street, you'll be headed towards the uh, Belmont Country Club, which is like right next to this it doesn't seem like it it seems like a lot of overkill to have a, a whole built golf amenity designed in 2024 when one has existed right next door that's all and quickly touching on one final meeting uh the department of transportation the dot uh held a meeting um, involving Waltham at, in our transportation plans. Uh, James uh, was present, thankfully, uh, and here to give his take on it as well. So I only have like one small bone to pick about the, the specific meeting itself, but it, it more ties into sort of the general priorities for transit in the city and how it's entirely car centric. And this is just more relating like the the in the in that meeting. Let me just get, share my screen again. Um, there we go. Okay, so essentially the meeting was talking about a number of intersections along 128 and what their plans were to uh, improve them. And I pretty routinely we'll take Totten Pond to access 128 and this stretch right here uh you will see in the morning people walking down the side of the road with no sidewalk and it's 
a routine occurrence every time i get get onto the highway i will see people like rain or shine and in that dot me meeting one of the first bits of public comment was someone saying hey there's no sidewalk on this road here and sort of that didn't really get addressed because most of what was getting talked about was how important it was to add extra lanes to the highway so this taking this location as an example this is like the c and d they call these c and d lanes which are essentially extra lanes added for the purpose of getting on and getting off the highway in these locations and it looks like well all, most of the things that they're addressing or most of the things that they'd be adding in the Waltham area are adding more of these the the issue is that you're talking about adding more lanes to try to make cars go faster along this whole thing and try to you know, reduce congestion which again means cars going faster but there isn't even like the most basic of pedestrian amenities anywhere along this whole stretch either along this road here or up a lot of Totten Pound Road which is Waltham not doing it one of the things that I wanted to tie this into is that I've been attending traffic commission meetings and in this is like another thing that you'd think would be a priority like you know but a, the traffic commission is primarily concerned in making cars move as fast as possible and in the 20 in the, in the most recent traffic commission meeting I think it was the 23rd they were talking about uh wanting to try to access funds that were set up for infrastructure improvements around by developers like a lot of times when developers do it do a project they'll put in money into a fund that can get used to improve in, in, an impact fund like things that are impacted in the area can get improved with that fund and apparently there's a lot of money for all these commercial developments around this area and they wanted to try to use that to do improvements to intersections around Waltham and yet at the same time you look at this intersect this area right here and you have this very obvious lack of pedestrianization so it's it's interesting seeing them openly talk about wanting to spend impact fund money on making like on re improving the light lights and timing so that they can have the lights green for longer so cars can go faster through them it strikes me as a very telling example of how Waltham prioritizes transit and cars versus pedestrianization and honestly the state kind of has the same sort of outlook on a lot of these things um so my takeaways from this are that uh the overall improvements to 128 are kind of baked in to just be more of the same that we see in a lot of other places which is adding lanes and not really doing much to address pedestrianization which i think speaks to the importance of demanding more pedestrianization from our city council and city councilors and the people running our traffic commission and demanding that that be made a priority at least at the local level um and one sort of I guess ray of sunlight in all of the traffic commission and DOT meetings was uh they had the better bus program uh people in again to talk about the uh, changes that would be getting made to the 70 bus and I thought that was good to see Colleen Bradley MacArthur there talking off committee uh about the importance of uh about the importance of like bus infrastructure and and asking them about uh specifically how Waltham could pilot programs for bus infrastructure and how Waltham could better serve bus uh transit and they also talked a bit about issues with uh bus queuing like buses getting uh backed up as a result of uh traffic and uh irregularities and like um users and about the what they were planning on doing to address that so part of that is uh changing up stops on this like the on the 70 bus but one of the things they did mention was that things like bus lanes help with that as well and it would be nice to see uh bus centric infrastructure actually take a priority in our traffic commission planning as opposed to more car infrastructure and I think seeing this definitely made me feel like I need to pay more attention to these traffic commission meetings definitely I mean if uh 
you know, a thousand Waltham residents came to every single traffic commission meeting and said, instead of, a, you know, C and D lanes, we put a bus lane in instead. I think that we could certainly yeah. have an yeah, impact. It, 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 it is interesting because like a lot of what influences people's driving behavior is the built environment, not the signage and things like that. And in just the last traffic commission meeting, they were talking quite a bit about like signage for like parking because one of the jokes was like, welcome to Waltham, no, no overnight parking, but yeah. it's, it's, it, and it's the same for speed limits, all sorts of things. And it's one thing to put up a sign saying, Hey, the speed limit is recommended to be 25 here. And it's another to make the road such that cars aren't going to want to drive above 25 on it. And one of those things works without having cops getting paid to, to police it. And the other really requires <laughs> it either is going to result in a lot of people speeding or uh, it's going to require a lot of enforcement to stop. So that's kind of what it comes down to. Absolutely. Well, thank you for going to that meeting that I did not attend. Uh, I'm glad to have you watching over these things. Um, and that will do it uh, for our show. A uh, reminder that next week is the fifth Monday uh, of the month. So city council will not meet. So we will not be meeting either. Uh, so we will be back in two weeks uh, to talk about committee meetings. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for chatting. And we'll see you Bye. next week. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm. Is Tisha going to be able to get on the camera or no? Yeah, I think I, definitely. I don't think we, I, 